You feel safe at home. It's where you can relax and retreat after a long day and open up to those you love and care about. But imagine an unexpected visitor is waiting for you, watching you, invading your home, that private space that you should feel protected, a place that becomes your final resting spot. This is what happened to Heather Maples. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kimberleya. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. I cannot wait to tell you the details of this case today. But before I get into it, I want to thank our sponsor for today. Our sponsor for today is Skillshare. I've been using Skillshare for probably about three years and I love to learn, so it is perfect. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. Invest in yourself and your personal growth. I love to learn. I'm always trying to learn new things. And lately, I have been wanting to learn more about storytelling so I can improve the content on this channel. I wanted to share a couple of the classes that I have been taking. Here's one about storytelling. It has been so in-depth, so helpful, and I'm just now starting to apply a lot of what I learned. I also love taking fun classes like this one called Plants at Home with Plant Queen. I think you can tell how fun this class is and I want you to look at my plants. I'm still learning, but I'm having so much fun. The first 1,000 people to use my link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Just look in the description box below. Do you have a specific skill you're trying to learn? Skillshare is the perfect place to start. From photography and illustration to graphic design, freelancing, and more. You can find classes that will match your goals and interests. There are a lot of Skillshare benefits. It's ad-free, so you can stay in the zone while you're exploring new skills. New premium classes launch each week, so there's always something new to discover. Their entire catalog is now available with subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. So thank you so much once again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and making this video possible. I forgot to mention this, so I'm putting it in the beginning of the video, but I've already been filming for a few minutes now. This is my new set. I've been working on this set for five months. Every little detail, all the antiques I collected, and of course working with one of my very good friends to put all of this together, who I am gonna link in my description box in case you are in LA and you're looking for a set designer. This set is also in my boyfriend's studio. He has a production space for creators like me and you if you are a creator. So if you're also in LA and you want to come in and look around and see what we offer for YouTube creators, I will leave all of the information below as well. So yes, this is it. Tell me what you think. I just felt like this was a very cozy, beautiful place for me to sit and tell you stories. Okay, let's get into the video. I want to introduce you to Heather Maples. Heather Nicole Maples was born in Florida, just like me, Ocala to be exact. She was born on a stormy night during Hurricane Andrew on August 23rd, 1992. Heather's mother, Jennifer Hunter, called Heather her hurricane baby. Little did they know that later in life, there would be a storm of sadness over this entire family. Helping others was second nature for Heather. She always walked around with a smile on her face. Heather's best friend growing up was a girl named Jennifer Holt Gomez. She met Heather in elementary school in Dallas, Texas. And this is where Heather lived at the time. Jennifer was actually really shy. She was quiet, she was introverted, and look how cute they look here. She was afraid to speak to people, but Heather just had this way about her. She completely brought Jennifer out of her shell. They both tried out for cheerleading and they were so excited, even though they were scared, but Heather wasn't afraid of anything and they end up making the team. Here they are in their cheerleading outfits. In 2004, Heather's mom gave birth to her second child, Ryan. He was diagnosed with a developmental disorder and Heather becomes more focused on him and nurturing him than doing just about anything else. She was only in seventh grade, yet she had the maturity to step in and help wherever she was needed. As a matter of fact, she spent most, if not all of her high school years being there for Ryan to help him learn to talk, learn to walk, all she seemed to care about was helping to raise Ryan. She loved him so much. 
Ryan really was Heather's inspiration to pursue a career in counseling. And it made sense that a person like Heather, with such a giving heart and compassion for those in need, would gravitate towards a helping career. Now she just needed to figure out which college to apply to. Well, that decision was kind of made for her, but not by her parents. Her mom was very supportive of Heather's own goals, but instead, it was a friend. After graduating from high school, Heather's friend Chaz called her out of the blue. He was living out in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and as they caught up with one another, Heather mentioned that she was looking for a school to attend. That's when he suggested that she come out to Tennessee and visit him. He said that it was a great little college town and he thought it would be the perfect place for someone like Heather. Before she even made the visit, Heather was already getting excited about the potential of moving. She really thought that a change of scenery in a college town with like-minded people would help her pursue her dreams. But instead of just sitting around daydreaming about it, Heather got to work planning her move. She was so excited for the possibilities that it would present to her. Not everyone was excited though. Her best friend Jennifer was pretty depressed. The thought of losing someone so close to her made her really sad, but she loved and admired Heather so much that she wanted to support her dreams. She thought that she was so brave, so she shared Heather's excitement. Besides, they still had the whole summer to hang out. It wasn't until January 2015 that Heather left Texas and arrived in Tennessee. What made the move even better was that she didn't even have to look for a place to stay because Chaz extended the opportunity for Heather to rent out the spare bedroom that he had in his two-bedroom apartment. Have you seen Heather? Because Chaz definitely wasn't the first guy who would offer Heather support, friendship, and anything else that she may want or need because guys showered her with attention. And a lot of times they tried to take the friendship to the next level. Heather was very sweet. She appreciated those who helped her. So of course she grew closer to Chaz as time went by. They were just friends to start, but it didn't take long before the roommates became much more. After all, she was spending so much time with Chaz. He was her only friend in Tennessee when she first got there. However, once she started spreading her wings, she attracted people wherever she went. There was just something about her that drew people in. And one of those people was Kelsey Price. From the very moment that Kelsey saw Heather, she was in awe of her. She thought Heather just gave off this good vibe. There was just a light about her. And the first thing she noticed was Heather's beauty. She was taken aback by how pretty she was. But more than that, she was captivated by the joy that Heather brought to every situation and she knew right away that she wanted to be friends with her. Kelsey thought to herself, this girl is going to be my best friend and Kelsey was right. They became the best of friends. They were practically inseparable. As a matter of fact, Kelsey even gets Heather a job with her. It was at the leasing office in the Cove apartment complex where they both lived. Now I want to show you a few pictures of this complex just to paint a picture of the atmosphere where they were working and living. Now do you remember being in college or being 22? You could be living it up right now, being 22 right this minute, because I know that I remember it and I remember it well. I remember how much fun it was and for everything to be new. Going out, going to bars and clubs, having drinks with my friends. It was an exciting and exhilarating time in my life. And that is what was going on for Heather. This is the new world that Kelsey and Heather were living in. They had a routine. They'd work hard during the day and well, they would definitely party hard at night. They had a lot of fun. They did all the things that many girls their age enjoyed. They would go get manicures. They would go to the movies. They would go shopping. There wasn't a moment where Heather wouldn't express how happy she truly was. This is what she wanted in her life. Everything was coming together, except maybe her love life. That was falling apart fast. When I was researching this case, the part about how much fun she and Kelsey were having definitely made me think about Chaz. I was like, what would he be doing this whole time? Would he be okay with his beautiful girlfriend just going out and mingling and drinking and having fun? It's tough to get into a more serious relationship at this time in your life because you're just getting started. And for Heather, this was a new start. Unfortunately, as kind as Chaz had been when Heather first arrived, it was really time to go their separate ways. Only about four months into the living situation in Tennessee, Heather and Chaz called it quits. Now it was said in my research that Chaz let Heather keep their apartment and it was a two bedroom and he just got all of his belongings out and moved. 
Heather was of course so grateful that she did not have to find another place to stay. However, when I was examining everything in this case, I personally thought that her apartment resembled a studio apartment and not a two bedroom. I couldn't gain additional information on this and I am so detail oriented. I was racking my brain to try to figure it out. I was looking at floor plans of the Cove apartment complex, comparing it to things I know about her bedroom and her apartment. And I was thinking maybe because she worked at the complex, she was able to easily take over a smaller unit that would have been less expensive. As I said, it certainly does not look like a two bedroom layout. Either way, all she had to do was roll right out of bed and walk to work. The leasing office was literally steps away from her apartment and that was super convenient. I don't have a car and I haven't for almost three years, so I know how important it is to be close to everything that you need and it's a bonus when you can actually walk to work. Of course, I do want a car one day. I'm kind of like working on that right now, but Uber works just fine, especially because the gas prices. Like any breakup, there was a transition period. However, Heather really wanted her freedom and she finally had it. She could come and go as she pleased and she had the whole place to herself. Speaking of which, in August of 2015, she called her mom with some very exciting news. Actually, Heather considered it to be the best news of her life so far. When her mom picked up the phone, Heather was so excited that she couldn't even get it out. She couldn't even form a sentence. She just kept saying, oh my gosh, Oh my gosh and her mom just kept repeating what <laughs> what she was finally able to get it out and the exciting news was that heather was accepted to college she said i was accepted to college i'm going to college and her mom couldn't believe it but of course she could because she knew how determined heather was she was so excited and her mom was so happy for her because this was something that heather did on her own it was her proud moment. She had always been helping others and now she could be proud that she had accomplished something for herself. Remember, Heather was born during a hurricane and now just as everything is coming together, a dark cloud is about to blanket her happy life and destroy everything that she had ever dreamed of. Those dreams abruptly disintegrated and a nightmare emerged from that wreckage. The nightmare began August 7th, 2015. Heather's best friend, Kelsey, arrived at the leasing office ready to start their day, but she noticed that Heather wasn't there yet. She didn't panic because she wasn't worried at all. This was a normal occurrence. Heather did have a tendency to sleep in and come to work late, and it was no big deal. It happens. Usually, Kelsey would just call Heather's cell and wake her up. It was about 9.15 at the time, and Kelsey called Heather cell a few times, and she didn't answer. At this point, Kelsey still wasn't worried. Actually, there was a game plan that was set in place by the best friends in the event that Heather didn't come to work, and she couldn't be reached on her phone. Heather told her to come to her apartment and just knock on the door. If that didn't work, come right in, because Heather routinely left her door unlocked. So she urged Kelsey to just come in and physically wake her up if all else failed. That day, Kelsey had to resort to this fail-safe protocol that they had in place. It was almost like a duty as a best friend to be there for each other, and she didn't waste any time. Kelsey made her way up the stairs to Heather's second floor apartment. She stood in front of that red door and knocked, and then she waited, and there was no answer. So she knocked again and waited, and there was still no answer. After knocking didn't wake Heather up, Kelsey entered the apartment without any fear or hesitation. But upon entering, Kelsey scanned over the entryway, and then she glanced toward the area where Heather's bed was located. Right away, she's relieved to see Heather is asleep in her bed. She sprawled out face down with her leg slightly dangling off the right side. Kelsey calls out to her friend, she says, Heather, Heather, and she's quickly looking around, looking at everything, and then she notices right away that there's no pillows on the bed and Heather's only wearing a top. There's nothing on the bottom. Kelsey's initial thought was, wow, she must have had quite a night out on the town. She probably came back, got right into bed, and passed out. So Kelsey decides she's probably going to need to do more than just call out her name. So this calls for a shake or a gentle tap on the foot to wake her up. Kelsey reaches out and taps Heather's right foot. 
while saying her name. It was at this moment that Kelsey knew something wasn't right. Heather's foot was as cold as ice. Sure, she wasn't covered up with the blankets, but this was a different type of cold. It was a dead cold with no life in it at all. That's the moment that Kelsey realizes that her best friend is no longer alive. The once vibrant, joyful girl has had all of the light in her extinguished. This makes me so sad. It makes me sad for poor Kelsey who loved and adored her friend to have to stumble upon such a horrific scene because in all the concentration Kelsey put on waking Heather up, she didn't notice the blood. Kelsey finally gained clarity and she realized that this was not a natural death. It was a murder. How incredibly frightening would that be? And that's exactly what was running through Kelsey's mind. Complete fear. Fear for Heather and then fear for herself because she didn't know if the person that did this was still there. Kelsey, without turning her head away from the scene, having to stare directly at the lifeless body of her best friend, she slowly backs out of the apartment. It's hard for her to breathe or to think. All she kept saying to herself is what the hell is going on? As soon as she is out of that apartment, she is frantically looking for her phone and then she calls 911. The operator answered and asked her what the emergency was. Kelsey manages to reply with, I think there's been a homicide here. And I can imagine uttering those words even as much as I say them on this channel to just know that that's what just happened. Officers and investigators were dispatched to the Cove apartments with the police department. From what I read in my research, everyone involved in this case was like a family. They were going to do everything and anything they had to do to solve this case. They were dedicated. They wouldn't sleep. They wouldn't eat. Everyone on this case related to Heather in some way, whether it was relating to her family. Many of these people had families of their own and daughters of their own. What they were about to witness was one of the worst crime scenes in their entire careers. And I mean that. I really do. I know I say that in videos, but this is coming from these investigators themselves. We're going to pick back up when detectives arrived. They knew right away, without a doubt, they were dealing with a murder. As they stepped inside Heather's apartment, they took note of the condition of the room. Remember that Heather is 22. It's the very first time that she's ever been on her own and her apartment wasn't exactly tidy. Interestingly, most of the videos or pictures I see while working on these cases consist of messy rooms, messy homes, most of them are women in their 20s. I say this because a messy home doesn't always mean that it's been ransacked or a struggle ensued, but it also shouldn't be a sign of any negativity toward Heather. Because we've all been messy at one point or another. Investigators took note of the apartment being in disarray. There was a toaster oven and a plastic bin by the door. There was moving boxes that were still unpacked that were located near the kitchen. Pots and pans were on the kitchen floor and a few bowls that appeared to belong to an animal, like a cat or a dog. Clothes were strewn around the room, laundry baskets were overflowing, and who doesn't have like the plastic grocery bag with all the other ones thrown in them? They found those located between the front door and the kitchen. There were several pairs of shoes and dress heels and sandals that were scattered around the apartment, along with various electric cords, phone chargers, etc. Just as Kelsey had witnessed, the pillows were not on Heather's bed. Instead, they looked as though they had been thrown off or pushed out of the way. Heather's blinds were drawn, but there was no forced entry on any of them. Another thing I noticed, if you look right here, the light was on, which of course leads me to believe that whatever happened to Heather happened at night because you can see how bright it is in her apartment in the daytime. Just a little clue that I wanted to mention. The lack of forced entry led police to believe that she knew the person who did this. She had possibly let them into her apartment at will. They saw Heather's partially nude body laying across her bed and they saw visible trauma to her, specifically her head, and there was a significant amount of blood in her blonde hair, as well as on the wall behind the mattress. 
They also saw obvious evidence that a person had forced themselves on her in a very brutal manner. Clear signs of that. The blood that they saw indicated that she was struck at least two times, if not more. Someone would have had to pull back as they swung after coming into contact with her on the initial blow for that spatter on the wall to be in the direction it was. They found strands of hair that were not consistent with Heather's as well as semen present on the scene, on her body and elsewhere. The most unbelievably shocking and sad thing they saw was Heather's left hand still clutching the bed sheet. She was putting up a fight. This was a struggle. This was a terrible situation. Just looking at it makes me physically upset inside. Hanging on to fight the pain, hanging on to life in those last moments to no avail. The hair tie on her wrist really stuck to me because it was so relatable. I could just imagine her coming home and letting her hair down and slipping the hair tie onto her wrist, not having a clue what was gonna happen to her that night. Now I wanna go back to the scene. As they collect more evidence, Heather's body was removed and transferred to the coroner's office for a more in-depth forensic examination. Meanwhile, investigators found a very significant clue. It was almost good luck because this did not happen all the time and it was a fingerprint. And I know you're probably thinking, uh, why is that extraordinary? But it was a bloody fingerprint. Any fingerprint is relevant and significant, but a fingerprint in blood meant that there was someone there. Someone touched Heather's blood if it wasn't Heather's. So the fingerprint was bound to be the killer's. It was located to the right of where Heather was laying, bright red in contrast to the cream colored sheet that it was imprinted on. It was a bit smeared as well. And this seemed to indicate that the person was in motion when the print was left. Not only that, this fingerprint was almost perfect. Almost as good as the one you would purposely make when you dip your finger in ink and roll it on a sheet of paper. However, their luck ran out. Investigators quickly and thoroughly processed the fingerprint and they got it over to the national database thinking that this was gonna lead them to the killer right away. They thought it would be a lead of a lifetime, a cut and dry case where the perpetrator would be caught right away, but that wasn't this case. No hits, nothing. They had nothing to go on. They were now banking on the forensic team to find something telling from the autopsy because they knew they needed to act fast. Without enough physical evidence, investigators have to use their own experience and expertise to carry out more of an old school investigation method. A few questions guide them. Why did someone do this? And better yet, who would do this? And where did they begin? They had no leads to work with except for the nature of the crime itself. This was an intimate crime, but ruthless and brutal. They felt like the answers might lie deep within Heather's private life. They need to know who Heather was behind closed doors, what company she kept, and who saw her last. They thought it would be best to start with Heather's phone, because nowadays, all of our secrets are hidden in this small device. It's with us more than any human. It was bound to hold many secrets and clues leading up to Heather's last night on Earth. The only problem was, he was protected with a passcode. And now I know what you're probably thinking, because I know I was. Why couldn't they just use some kind of forensic technology to open it up, but this is 2015. Perhaps that wasn't available, or they were trying to act fast because those techniques take time, which they did not have to spare. This issue caused the investigation to come to somewhat of a standstill. We don't write down our friends' names and telephone numbers anymore. We used to, but we don't have a directory or anything like that. They were going to have to start at the beginning, speaking to people closest to Heather, Heather's family. I repeat this with every case, but it's true. One of the hardest parts of an officer's job is to inform a parent that their child is deceased. It never gets easier. You never get used to it. It's a gut-wrenching experience every single time. This time, they had help. Kelsey volunteered. 
She did not want the news to come from a stranger. She wanted it to come from someone who loved Heather. Kelsey called Heather's mother and right away she asked her if she was sitting down. And I don't think anyone who hears that question thinks they're about to hear good news. Then Kelsey said, Heather's gone. And Jennifer was a bit confused because she knew Heather was supposed to be at work that day. So she asked, well, where is Heather? Kelsey just bluntly said, Heather is dead. And chills ran down my spine when I read that. Chills and sadness and fear. Jennifer let out a scream and yelled, no, somebody's killed my daughter. And for her, it seemed unreal. It seemed like a nightmare, like she would wake up and this wouldn't be true. She had just seen Heather less than a week before this. Heather had called her mom and made somewhat of an impromptu trip back to Texas. She said, mom, I bought tickets and I'm coming home for the weekend. They got to spend quality time together. When it was time for Heather to go, Jennifer drove her to a friend's house. She hugged her and kissed her goodbye. And she told her that she loved her and she had no idea that that would be the very last time that she saw her daughter alive. It was so brave of Kelsey to take on the task of letting Jennifer know the bad news. And now she had yet another task and possibly a harder one. Investigators needed her help. She was the closest person to Heather and they wanted to know all of her secrets, starting with her romantic relationships. So Kelsey began with Chaz. As it turns out, the relationship was a mess. It was very tumultuous. Kelsey admitted that there were allegations of physical altercations. She told them that Heather confided in her about Chaz and his anger issues and that he had put hands on her. Countless phone calls in which Heather would scare Kelsey. She thought that maybe she would have to go over there and intervene. That never happened, but what did happen was Kelsey helped Heather get a restraining order against Chaz. That really sent a message that Heather wanted him to stay away from her for good. Investigators confirmed this information with Jennifer, and she said that her daughter confided in her as well. She also got phone calls where Heather was yelling and crying, and she was shocked and upset. And she was looking for advice about what to do. Jennifer told her to leave and come back home, but Heather had her sights fixated on her goals. She didn't want to give up, so she stayed, but she did manage to get Chaz out of her life. Or did she? That was the question that investigators wanted the answer to. Who was Chaz? And did something trigger him? Was this yet another act out of anger that went too far? Chaz was the first real lead in this case. Their next step, track down Chaz for an interview. But then something happened back at the crime scene. A guy comes barreling into Heather's apartment right under the police tape, determined to get inside. It's actually pretty common for the individual who committed the crime to come back to the scene because they're connected to it. They want to relive it and they can't help but insert themselves into the case. And for those reasons, the police didn't exactly stop him. They wanted to see what he would do. This man seemed genuinely shocked, just distraught. And he tells police his name is Michael and that he was a very close friend of Heather's. But then he does something totally unexpected. He puts his hand into his pocket. Now that's, that's, that's a no-no, but he immediately pulls out a set of keys and dangles them in front of the police. You probably could have guessed they were Heather's keys, including a key to her apartment. Wow. Police are absolutely stunned because could Michael be another suspect? No one broke in. So did Michael let himself inside with these keys? Police immediately detain Michael. He's brought in for an interview at the police department. And investigators have a lot of questions and I do have some of that interview, so I will play it for you now. How do you know Heather? I met her at the bar. This is gonna be rude, but I gotta ask it because that sometimes details are important, sometimes you're not. The first time you met her, did you have sex with her? I did not. I've never had any contact other than the hug. I've never even kissed her. So you, you never had sex with her? You know, so, okay. Michael's demeanor was one of sadness. He was distraught over his friend being deceased and he was completely cooperative. He was willing to answer 
all of their questions. I want you to remember that he says he's never kissed her. Just hugged her. That's it. Meanwhile, Kelsey is being interviewed about what she knows about Michael. She lets investigators know that she knew about Michael and he seemed to be really nice, but he was also really into Heather. He had a girlfriend, but Kelsey assumed like many other men in Heather's life, he probably had a crush on her. However, investigators get some bombshell information from Michael himself during the interview, and this gives them cause to be concerned. He reveals that he was with Heather the night she was murdered. Actually, he spent quite some time with her that night. Here's what he told investigators. What was the story on that? Yesterday, she um, asked me if I was off work. She said she was hungry. I was like, cool, let's go to Old Chicago. Went to Old Chicago. So first, they went to Old Chicago to eat. Here it is on the screen. I like showing these places just so that we can get more context. So they have dinner. And he says he leaves to go back home. And Heather goes out with some friends. Seems pretty normal, except she calls Michael at 11.40 p.m. She called me at 11.40. So at 11.40 she calls you? Yes. Okay. And so she tells me that I need to come to the bar. She really needs me right now. There's people hitting on her and she's really upset. I've got to say, he's a pretty good friend if he's willing to stop whatever he's doing and come out to a bar to help her out. Michael gives police a name, Artavio. Apparently, Heather was scared. She was uncomfortable. And when Michael gets there, he confronts Artavio and tells him to leave Heather alone. That's pretty brave. He says Artavio had been trying to make advances towards Heather and she just wasn't interested and he wouldn't stop. Michael says to Heather that he thinks he should probably take her home, but she insists they go grab some food because she's hungry. They go to a 24-hour diner called Handlebars. Listen to what Michael says here. He orders biscuit, gravy, eggs, two eggs, sausage. He knows exactly, I mean exactly, what she ordered. I'm telling you, I probably would never remember any of that. I probably wouldn't even remember what I ordered, let alone the person I was with. And sometimes this is important because when people are guilty, they tend to focus on tiny details to seem credible, seem like they're telling the truth. And I wondered, could this be what he was doing? However, he says that after they were done eating, he took Heather home. He says this was around 2.30 in the morning on August 7th. She was done. I drove her to her apartment, dropped her off. I watched her walk up the stairs, and she was like, okay, okay. Now wait, because we actually have some footage from the restaurant. Yes, here it is, and I'm sorry, it's black and white, and it's not the best, but here they are together, and correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't that look like a kiss? He stated he never got physical with her, not even a kiss. Those were his words, only a hug. So what is this? Looks friendly enough, but it does look like a kiss. But maybe it's innocent. It's a friendly kiss, right? You tell me. And look at that arm touching her lower back. There's definitely more affection coming from him than from her. And they take a selfie. And then this is them getting into Michael's Jeep and leaving. The time from the videos seems to match up with Michael's story. Then he gives them some crucial information or his opinion on her door. He says whoever went inside probably did so because her door was unlocked. And this part made me sad. She had given Michael her keys earlier that night. She didn't have a pocket or a purse. And he says he just forgot to give them back. Hmm. But couldn't she have locked the door? She could lock the door from the inside. So was it really unlocked and someone just let themselves inside? Or did Michael go inside? So many questions here. He gladly agrees to a DNA sample and being fingerprinted. And they still aren't sure about Michael because he was the very last person that they have actual proof saw her alive. So he is still a person of interest. The autopsy report was finalized. The manner of death was a homicide, 
and the cause of death was strangulation and blunt force trauma to her head. A DNA swab was also taken due to the forced intercourse, and they tried to match both this DNA and the fingerprint to Michael, but it was not a match. Heather's ex-boyfriend Chaz is now back under the microscope, and they find out that he moved out of town after the breakup, but oddly enough, he was back in town on the night of her murder. They finally bring him in for questioning, and he does admit their relationship was toxic, but he says he has nothing to do with her death whatsoever. He tells them that he hasn't been over to her place in months. Chaz also provides an alibi, and after they diligently check it out, they confirm he could not have been in the area at the time of the crime. So they rule him out for now. They are at a loss, except they do have one person they can probe for information, and that was Kelsey. This time, Kelsey felt like she was actually a suspect, as though they were running out of leads and that she was being questioned in a way that made her think they had their sights set on her potentially being involved in some way since she was the person who found Heather. And I cannot imagine what that would have felt like. This was Kelsey's best friend. No one wants to feel like they're being accused of anything, but specifically when it comes to someone you care about. And you want to keep your composure or else you might actually look like you're guilty. But you want to just say, are you kidding me? I'm not involved in my best friend's death. However, she was completely cooperative. And this time, they were asking some very intense and personal questions. I do not have the entire interview. But they really were trying to dig in to Heather's sex life and her lifestyle. Here's some of that interview now. And you describe her as your best friend, right? Correct. What was Heather's lifestyle? Was she a big drinker? She liked to smoke a joint? She take pills? Was was she promiscuous? She liked to drink. I realize that these are hard questions to answer. You don't want to betray your friend, but there is something called victimology, and it's vital that investigators know. It is imperative that they have this accurate picture of what the victim was like. Even if they did drugs, even if they were promiscuous or they hung out in certain places, it's not victim blaming. I just wanna clarify that and give a distinction. This helps. It doesn't hurt the case. They were really focused on Heather's sex life, which I'm sure was difficult for Kelsey to divulge. I would feel very uncomfortable, but she knew it was to help catch who did this. Kelsey lets them know that once Heather and Chaz broke up, she was indeed having fun with whoever she pleased. Her social life was very active. It wasn't hard because she was so fun, so beautiful, so easy to be around. There was never a lack of men to choose from. As Kelsey put it, Heather was a boy magnet. She even added that she had men around her all the time, staring at her, wanting her. Now she provides investigators with a list of all the guys that Heather has been in contact with recently. Then they want to know what Kelsey knows about the night of the crime. We don't see Kelsey in the video. She's not with Heather, but she gets this Snapchat. Kelsey gets up. It's the middle of the night. She has to go to the bathroom. She pulls out her phone like a lot of us do, and she sees it. Here's the picture right here. This is a picture of Heather and a guy named Artavio. You've heard this name before, remember? This was the guy that she ended up being scared of, telling Michael to come out to the bar and protect her. The one that Michael gets into a little conversation with, a little confrontation with. But here, they look happy, like they're just having a good time. Nothing nefarious seems to be going on, and Kelsey just thinks nothing of it. She just took a look at it and then went back to bed. While she's asleep, she has no idea how that night was going to play out that Artavio would upset Heather, upset her enough to call Michael to come to her rescue. And sadly, that's the last message Kelsey ever received from her best friend. Investigators want to know everything Kelsey knows about this man. Who is Artavio? Remember Heather's cell phone? Well, on a whim, and maybe as a Hail Mary, they asked Kelsey if she happens to know the passcode. They had asked everyone, even Heather's mother, and no one knew it, but Kelsey does. I feel like you should always give it to someone. My daughter knows mine. Kelsey knows it, and it's a breakthrough. It's one they really needed because there could be calls to trace, or better yet, texts in Heather's own words 
that would reveal more information as well as a timeline of events from that night. Finally, investigators have a new and promising lead. So they go through Heather's text, piecing everything together. The timeline that Michael provided matches up with her texts. Then after Michael left, Heather apparently texted someone else. Someone investigators had already been interested in, Artavio. I know you could have probably guessed. The texts to Artavio were asking him to come over to her apartment just hours before being found by Kelsey. And this is huge. He's the next person that they need to bring in for questioning. No doubt about it. I also have some of that interview as well. It's better to hear it play out instead of me explaining it. What did you do yesterday afternoon? Uh, we hung out with Heather, we drank some tequila, and then we went to gyms for a while. Okay, and who was Heather? Uh, a friend of mine. <laughs> now here's the thing. I'm going to let you in on something. Apparently, Artavio doesn't know that Heather is dead. And the investigators want to use this to their advantage to see how he answers their questions. And you may be thinking, well, that doesn't make sense. Wouldn't the murderer know? But the thing is, we don't know if she was dead or alive when the person left her that night. They know nothing. So they question him about the Snapchat picture first. I'll show you a picture, okay? Do you have any idea when that would have been taken? It was a little bit before the left to go to gyms. Who took that picture? She took it. Do you know if it was posted or sent to anybody? Uh, it was on Snapchat. Then about getting that text message late at night asking him to come over around 2.30. If Heather says that you came back over after she got home, would we believe that not to be true? Yeah, I didn't show back up over there. They had a text me at like 2.30 or something. Can I see the text? But I was already asleep. I saw it this morning. He says he was asleep and he saw it the next morning. But can they verify that? They press him and they press him and they press him with lies in my point of view, and that's allowed in investigations. So they begin to say that they've got all this evidence that people saw him at the scene and that his phone records put him there. This is to get a reaction. In actuality, they don't have that evidence. What do you think of this tactic? Because I've always had mixed feelings about it. People saw you go in the apartment. Phone records put you at the apartment. You were with her yesterday. Your picture was with her, okay? Because here's what I'm going to tell you at this point, Teddy. I believe she texted you to come back over there. You went over there, and then something happened. No. He denies being there. Despite that, the investigators tried to get him to crack. And this next part really got to me. And not only was this girl raped, she's dead. What? No way. This way, okay? And here's what I'm going to tell you. There's DNA all over that girl. It's going to come back, I believe, to one Mr. Tay. Well, I'll come back to me. He seems shocked. If he's not guilty, he was just told that his friend is dead. And this is how he's been informed. It just hurts a little. At this point, no one knows the extent to which he may be involved. But hearing and watching that response, it struck me as very genuine. He gives them a DNA sample, he gives them fingerprints, and now it's another waiting game while they dig into the timeline that Artavio gave them. And it turns out he was not asleep, but he was with another woman. All of this was confirmed. He did not answer Heather's text and he wasn't at her place that night. Another dead end. Super frustrating and time is ticking by. Investigators are just making their way down the list of friends provided by Kelsey in alphabetical order nonetheless. Next on the list is a guy named Brandon. That's it. No last name was given because Kelsey didn't have much information on him. She's doing her best. She said that she and Heather met him and his roommate at a bar, which was pretty normal, but she didn't know much else. Therefore, they dig through all the notes on the case. And there are a number of them from many different investigators and forensic technicians and police. Just a lot to compile, but to their surprise, Brandon's name had come up a few times before. They said that his name had been circled on one of the reports and then another time, his name had been circled twice. The thing is, they never heard about Brandon being with Heather that night and there were no pictures provided that placed him there. Yes, they met in the bar at some point in the past, 
but how does he fit in on the last night that Heather was alive? They don't get their hopes up first. They needed to find out Brandon's last name or some kind of information so that they can track him down. They didn't need to look far. Now, when I tell you this, some of you may leave thinking everything is over and it's not. I really like when you say until the end because it's the conclusion of the case. It's important. It's the whole story, closure, or more answers. They didn't have to look far because the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Crime Lab submitted the results of the bloody fingerprint. That fingerprint, which turned out to be a right thumbprint, belonged to Brandon. And now they had a last name, Bowling. Brandon Bowling's fingerprints had been taken when he was applying for a job, and those fingerprints were put into APHIS. This was it. This is the lead they needed, but it doesn't just end there. Why? Not only why was his fingerprint left in blood, but why did this happen? You want to know. You need to know. It seemed like Brandon would be the only person left to answer those questions. It had been eight days since Heather was found, and now they needed to find Brandon. They were able to track him down at his current place of employment as a driver for the local Jimmy John's. He was at work that night, so they sat outside in the parking lot until they caught a glimpse of Brandon. Then they walked right up to him and simply stated that they were working on the homicide of Heather Maples. They asked him if he'd be willing to come to the police department and talk to them. I really want you to hear this interview. I want your thoughts on so much of this, especially what's going on here next. Here's what transpired in the interview. How do you know Heather? We met at Jim's. You know when that was? Uh, he said they initially met at Gentleman Jim's bar, which is actually the same bar Heather was at before she left for her apartment. His story about when they met matched up to what Kelsey told them, that they met three or four months ago. So far to me, Brandon seems pretty calm. Then they ask him this. Ever been to her apartment? I have been to her apartment. The times you had gone over there to check to let you in or was the door unlocked or something she like usually left their door unlocked. Let me ask you this, have you ever been sexually intimate with her? Second time ever. You hooked up with her? Yeah, we did. What's the last time you were in her apartment? That might have been in July. So he says, that she usually left the door unlocked. Plus he admits they've hooked up before, but he says he hasn't been to her place since July, but we know better. Investigators knew better. There's no way his thumbprint could end up on that bedsheet unless it was covered in blood that night. That fingerprint was still wet when investigators came on the scene that day. Now they had to be more aggressive. They already know he's lying. So of course, this next tactic is to get a confession. It's very useful, and here's what they do. This time, unlike with Artavio, the investigators really do have physical evidence that links Brandon to the crime. They are not bluffing. You know you were there, you know what happened. So now you need to tell me so that I can understand. I don't know I was there. I don't know I was there. That's the thing. Okay, well then how did your bloody fingerprint help? Get on the bed. There's no way I did anything. She was, she's got accepted into college. I was happy for that. I don't believe you don't remember what happened. Look at me, young man, because this is important. They can put you to death. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. This is the most important conversation you had in your life. The only way your bloody fingerprint got there is your hands bloody. And you had your hands on her. And then tell me what happened. And his whole demeanor changes. This is the psychology. This is the body language. Look at him. Before he's confronted, he has more confidence. He's sitting up. And then after, you see the change in him. You see him give in. His body slouches. He's fiddling with his hat. But do you hear what he says? His choice of words is so interesting to me. Instead of confidently saying, I wasn't there, he chooses to say, I don't know I was there. I don't know I was there. I don't know I was there. That's the thing. When I first heard this, it made me think he was trying to insinuate that he was maybe too intoxicated to recall. But wait. He says there's no way he would have hurt her. She was about to go to college and he was happy for her. Really? Wait until you find out all the details. Because I don't think he was happy for her at all. He never confessed to 
anything, but he did allow them to take a DNA sample. They didn't let him go that night, no. They arrested him and charged him with first degree murder. One of the detectives calls Heather's mom right away with the news that they may have just arrested Heather's killer. Nothing is going to make up for the fact that Heather is gone. But the next best thing is catching the monster who took her away from those that loved her. Jennifer just couldn't understand why this happened. She was relieved with the news, but that question remained. Why? And then who? Who was Brandon Bowling? His DNA ended up matching to all 16 swabbed areas on and inside Heather's body. Yeah. But they almost didn't need those matches because they found something way more damning. They gained access to Brandon's phone, and this is where all our secrets lie. And Brandon had been hiding something for a few months now. Souvenirs in the form of pictures and video. On his phone were videos of him forcing himself on Heather on two previous occasions while she was under the influence of a substance of some kind. I think you can guess what I mean by that. Yeah, he did this to her. Not at will. How he did this, how it was set up, whether it was all planned and he slipped it into her drink at the bars they went to on those nights, we don't know. But it was clear, perfectly crystal clear, that he was a horrible person, a horrible human being. Then, horrifically, they find the final moments of Heather's life recorded on video. Brandon recorded the whole thing. It was something these investigators said that they can never unsee, ever. It was the worst moment that they ever witnessed. An innocent young lady fighting so hard to stay alive and a ruthless piece of crap that didn't want to be told no. He was there for one reason. He wanted what he wanted and he stole it from Heather along with her life. But he had done this time and time again. But this time, she fought back. This time, it went too far. Other women's nightmares were this man's souvenirs to play over and over again so that he could relive his evil conquest and it makes me so sick. She wasn't the only one in his phone, but wait. During the bond hearing, Brandon's mother, Patricia Ann Bowling, testified about her son's character. It was then that we find out that Brandon was adopted at only 10 weeks old and he was raised by the Bowling family. He grew up playing football, he was in the school band. He started working at various fast food restaurants when he was just in 10th grade. He was a good student and worked at other places like Best Buy, Amazon, Kroger, Transamerica, and then Jimmy John's. Okay, but what does that have to do with what he did after work hours? The judge did not grant the amount that Brandon's attorneys wanted, which was $50,000. Instead, he set bond at $1 million. The trial began in February of 2018 the prosecution had an unsurmountable amount of evidence. There really was no way out, so Brandon had to plead guilty to the murder of Heather Maples. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison without the possibility of parole. But what happened next is something I was pretty shocked about, and it has stuck with me. On the day that the plea deal was signed, Heather's mother read her victim impact statement in court. And she felt like it was the very last time she would ever be able to speak for her daughter and talk about her loss and what it meant to everyone that loved her. She said in part, I forgive Brandon Bowling for killing my daughter because she believed in her heart that she was supposed to forgive and that is what she did. I forgive Brandon Bowling for killing my daughter. From that day forward, I learned, don't worry about anything and pray about everything. Everyone in the courtroom had tears in their eyes but it's what Heather's mom does next that moved me to my core. After the hearing, she walked out in the hallway where Brandon's mother was standing. She walks over and she gives her a hug. Wow. It just shows you the character that Jennifer had and that she passed on to Heather. Jennifer said that she could tell Patricia was heartbroken and they had both lost a child and she wanted her to know that she understood her pain. Kelsey added that Heather was an amazing person, a contagiously, beautifully incredible person. Their last time together was at the office they worked at. That night they got out of work about five and they walked home together 
and that was the last walk home that Kelsey ever got with her. She said she's definitely forever in her heart and in her mind all day, all the time. My heart breaks hearing this and having to relay it to all of you. If you love somebody, you've got to hold them tight because you never know when your last day with them will be. I just want to thank all of you for being here today and subscribing if you haven't done so already. It really means a lot to me. Thank you for all of your comments and thank you for coming back every week to watch another one of my videos. I will see you in my next one. Bye.